proceed. Uh, we pray that you would continue to bless them and keep them, that your grace and mercy would be upon them. Your light would continue to feel that, fill their eyes and your love and hope their hearts and minds. I also pray for our for our section coming up here on the one new man. We ask that you're, you would give us all of the right words to share and also to um, that we could touch your heart and your purpose with our prayers. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So good evening, everybody. Um, we we are hosting tonight. This is Gurney and Harriet. Most of, some of you or most of you know us. And we, I, we prayed about this and we've talked about it back and forth. So what you're about to hear, probably mostly from me, is actually not necessarily me. It's the conclusion of our discussions about what it is we're supposed to share. Um, and and I have I have some notes. I don't know if we'll get through all of them. I, I timed it and it's less and it and it and it's possible, but I expect that we may um, deviate in a couple of places because there's some things that we've been talking about. So um, the title of of this particular discussion is "One New Man in the Heart of God from the Beginning." That's that's what we're going to be talking about. So I'll just start working on my notes. I'm, I'm going to read some scriptures. I'm going, to, I'm going to refer to more scriptures than I actually read, but there's some I want to want to read because they tie into what we're saying more, more directly. God created man in his image to have fellowship with man. Even though man made a bad choice in Genesis 2, 15 to 17, Eve, where Eve was deceived and Adam disobeyed, God was not frustrated. God had a plan. His plan was to choose a people to represent himself on the earth and through that people to bring redemption to the whole earth. In Genesis 12, 1 to 3, it says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treads, treats you with contempt, and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. In Isaiah 2, in Isaiah 2, verses 2 to 4, it says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people co shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn more anymore. And finally, in Amos 9, 11 to 12, it says, On that day I will rise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as, as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. So th these are just some of the scriptures. And it's really an important point that five times in Genesis, when God told Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, 22, 18, and 18, 18, and Isaac in Genesis 26, 4, and Jacob in Genesis 28, 14, that all the nations would bless themselves through them, through Israel. Now, as a footnote, my wife, who's the the Hebrew scholar points out that in Gen Genesis um, 22, 18 and 26, 4, the verb stem used there is reflexive and would typically be translated, all the nations of the earth shall bless themselves by your descendants because you have obeyed my command. It's actually translated this way in the Tanakh and the RSV and the NET. The other three, three verbs, the verb stem can be translated either reflexive or passive. The difference is that a reflexive translation makes it clear that nations have to take an action to receive the blessing, which is what's pointed out in Romans 10, 9 and 10. Okay. So the one new man is a biblical concept that helps us understand more fully what God did when he sent out his son, the Jewish Messiah, to be born as a baby in Bethlehem, to live a sinless life, and to die by crucifixion and be raised from the dead on the third day. So, but what we've shown 
in, at least in this first couple of minutes through just the Old Testament is God intended all along to call a people from the whole world to gather people to himself. So the question becomes, what does one new man mean? In our exploration of one new man, we will, we will divide Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 to 23 into four sections and consider each in its turn. Um, most of them briefly, but one of them quite extensively. So the first section is in Ephesians 2, 11 and 12. So then remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. At that time you were without the Messiah, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. This is the state of all Gentiles without Christ. The second part, Ephesians 2.13, expresses again God's love for everyone. The second part, uh, it says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. This is elaborated on in John, in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 14 to 17. Yeshua himself, Yeshua describes himself as the good shepherd. He says, in part, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me. As the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. But I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Then, then there will be one flock and one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I'm laying down my life so I can take it up again. Note that when Yeshua was here, his, his audience was entirely J Jewish. So the fold that he was talking to was the Messianic or the Jewish fold, and the fold that he was going to get was the Gentile fold. Yeshua also let his disciples know that there will be one flock and one shepherd. Those who are far away, that's me, in Ephesians 2.13, are the same as those who are not of this fold in John 10.16. Yeshua also, oh, I'm sorry, it seems clear from this that God's intention in calling Israel to be his chosen people was to utilize Israel to redeem a people from all of mankind for himself. From Amos 9, 11 to 12 and other scriptures, we realize that the people will include Jews and Gentiles. In the third section, which we'll spend a little bit of time on, Ephesians 2, 14 to 16 says, For he is our peace, who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility in his flesh. He made of no effect the laws consisting of commands as expressed in regulations so that he might create in himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross and put, host and, put the and put the hostility to death by it, the hostility between the two parties. It's the, there's one sentence in this section where the one new man is defined. It starts at the end of version 14 and goes to the end of 15, and it says, in his flesh, he made of no effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations so that he might create in himself one new man from the two resulting in peace. This is the only scripture where the phrase one new man appears in the Bible as far as I know. Reviewing the scripture, reviewing this sentence in, in, in detail, his flesh refers to Yeshua. He refers to Yeshua. He at the beginning as Yeshua made, made a, and then the law is the Torah, and the two, from the perspective of the law, are the Jew and Gentile. So rereading it with those translations, Yeshua made of no effect the, the Torah consisting of commands and expressions in regulations so that Yeshua might create in himself one new man from the Gentiles and Jews resulting in peace. So that's Gurney's free translation. You won't find that one in any Bible I know about, but that's a, an explanation of, of what we're talking about. The two groups are the Gentiles and Jews, as I just stated. Um, in some parts of scripture, they're referred to as the circumcised and uncircumcised. And say, so we've talked about the fact that Yeshua did this. So the next thing we're going to do is say, well, what does God mean when he says, I'm going to make two things into one? And the first place in the Bible where this is, where this is used is back to Genesis again in 2.24, where he says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Am I over talking you? you no. Okay. Um, here's one here one new thing being formed from two distinct entities, male and female. 
there are a few important concepts. Now, there's one new thing as a marriage, a covenant, a, a husband and wife, and it's being formed from two distinct things, a female and a male. But there's some important things to understand in, when God introduces this concept in Genesis. The man does not st stop being male, and the woman does not stop being a woman. You know, the point of the one new thing is to enable procreation or reproduction, and both kinds are reproduced. You get males and females out of marriages. And from the context of the one new man, both Jew and Gentile are reproduced, and they have to work together to reproduce. If a husband and wife don't work together, they don't get any children. So if the so for us to be most effective in the one new man, we have to work together in order to get the accomplish the reproduction that God wants. And the final thing is pointed out clearly in the New Testament, what God has put together, let no man put asunder. But it's also pointed out in the Old Testament. Let's take a look at this scripture. Um, Malachi 2, 13 to 16. There's another thing you do. You are, co you are covering the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer respects your offerings or receives them, receives them gladly from your hands. And you ask why? Because even though the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, you have acted treacherously against her. She was your marriage partner and your wife by covenant. Didn't God make them one and give them a portion of the, of, of the spirit? What is the one seeking? Godly off, offspring. So watch yourselves carefully so that no one acts treacherously against the wife of his youth. If he hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord God of Israel, he covers his garment with injustice, says the Lord of armies. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully and do not act treacherously. Okay. Um, and in Matthew... Uh, chapter 19, 4 to 6, Jesus, Yeshua himself says, you know, what God has put together, let nobody separate. So the, in Malachi, part of what's going on here is, is it explains why the Ecclesia has a hard time at times getting, getting their prayer answered or seeing the power of God poured out. And going back to the scriptures, because, he, because even though the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, You've acted treacherously against her. She was your marriage partner and your wife by covenants. Departing from my script for a while. See, the point is, Jesus came here to gather this people out of the world for the Lord. And that was represented by Jews and Gentiles. And it was represented by pouring out the spirit on Cornelius, like it says in Malachi. He gave, gave her. Now, the Bible doesn't say whether the Jew is the male or the Gentile, or the Gentile is a male. But, but and I think the way I understand it is, you consider you can consider them both either one or the other. The point is that we, that the ecclesia was not supposed to divorce itself from the other party. And this speaks to the sin that the Gentile church committed around 400 when it separated itself, when it separated itself from from the um, messianic body, and and some Caesar or somebody declared that you know Saturday was no longer the Sabbath. Now Sunday's the Sabbath, and all this other stuff that happened. You know, 1,700 years ago or so, and and but the point in Malachi is that both parts of this tree of faith, which we know from Romans is an olive tree, should not act treacherously against each other. So whether it's the it's the Gentile part of the church and how it views the Messianic part of the church or the Ecclesia, or whether it's the Messianic part of the church and how it views the Gentile part of the church, we have to accept and honor and 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 respect the traditions that the Father has given to each of us. Uh, so, and we could go on on that, but we have limited time. So, um, returning to Ephesians 2, 14 to 16, Romans 10, 9 and 10 tell us what must be done to receive the reconciliation and salvation, that salvation is offered to all men, but we have to do something. The reflexive verb we referred to in Genesis. Now, and Ephesians 2, 14 to 16 has to be combined with, this verse has to be combined with Acts 15, 1 to 29, 1 Corinthians 7, 17 to 24, and Romans 11, 16 to 24, to completely understanding the meaning of, of no effect, when he said he made it of no effect. We're not going to get into that detail now. But looking again at the meaning of the one new man, in the Second Testament, six Scriptures reinforce the model of a marriage clearly, stating that Gentiles are not required to become Jews, and the Jewish people are not required to become Gentiles. So the two scriptures I want to read are Acts 15, 1 to 29, and 1 Corinthians 7, 
17 to 20. So we'll do 15 and just 28 and 29, which is about this first Jerusalem council. And it's, this is the summary of what they decided. For it was the Holy Spirit's decision and ours not to place further burden on you, referring to the Gentiles, beyond these requirements, that you abstain from food offered to idols, from blood, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. You will do well if you keep yourselves from these things. And Paul, writing to the Corinthians, makes the following statement, that each one live his life in the situation the Lord assigned when God called him. This is what I command to all the churches. Was anyone already circumstanced when he was called? He should not undo his circumcision. Was anyone called why uncircumcised? He should not get circumcised. Circumcision does not matter, and, and uncircumcision does not matter. Keeping God's commands is what matters. Let each of you remain in the situation where he was called. While this refers to certain things that people were kind of strangely doing back at that time, it also refers in, gen in general to the Jewish to the Jewish people. The Jewish people are circumcised. And at the time Paul was writing, Jews were circumcised, Gentiles were not. So it's saying, if you're circumcised, you don't have to become uncircumcised. You don't have to become like a Gentile. And if you're uncircumcised, you don't have to become circumcised. You don't have to become a Jew. So between these two scriptures, we see it's clear, this reinforces this notion of a marriage in the one new man, that the Jewish to remain Jew and the Gentiles to remain Gentile, and we get to be one new thing in Christ. Okay, so so this is also made clear, even clearer, and we want to have some time for questions, in Romans 11, 16 to 24, which I'm, I was going to read, but I'm going to skip so we don't run out of time, but I'll just summarize it for you, where he says, where Paul points out that the that if the first fruits are holy, so is the whole branch, whole batch, and we're we we are part of this tree which is rooted rooted in Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and there are some branches broke off so the Gentiles to get in, but the, but those branches if they could be grafted back in again by our Father God, so we have to recognize that all of us, both sides of us, both parts are parts of this tree of faith in the Lord. Um, so so in this last section because we want time for some questions. In Ephesians 2, 17 to 22, we see, when the Messiah came, he proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away, that's the Gentiles, and peace to, to those who were near, that's the Jews. For through him, we both have access by one spirit, Ruach HaKadosh, the, to the Father. So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. The whole building being put together by him grows into a holy sanctuary in the Lord. You also being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit. As we observed earlier, it was always, always from the very beginning in the heart of God to have fellowship with man. The far away refers to Gentiles and the near to Jews. The one new man is related to the term reconnection when used to define what is happening in the earth today. Reconnection itself is not a biblical term. The word does not occur in the Bible, although it is used to describe events in the church. In order for a reconnection to occur, there, there must have been a disconnection. And this connection that our God is terminating in, e in these days is the one between Messianic Jews and Gentile believers, the thing he expressed dislike for in Malachi. We are returning to being one new man in Christ Jesus. Um. So Galatians 3, 24 to 29 puts it this way. Accordingly, the Torah functioned as a custodian until the Messiah came so that we might be declared righteous on the grounds of trusting and being faithful. But now that the time for this trusting, trusting faithfulness has come, we are no longer under a custodian. For in union with the Messiah, you are all children of God through, his trust, through trusting faithfulness. Because as many of you as were immersed in the Messiah have clothed yourselves with the Messiah, in whom there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free man, neither male nor female. For in union with the Messiah, Yeshua, you are all one. Also, if you belong to the Messiah, you are seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. Okay. I might have swiped that version from the complete Jewish Bible, just for reference. Um, Remember that this one, this one in Messiah is like the one in marriage. We are one new man, but we do not stop being who we are. For the first 300 years of the church, it was composed of Jewish and Gentile believers working together to transfer the world with the gospel, to transform the world with the gospel. God's power was 
Released in full because of the church, Jew and Gentile understood its calling, walking in the power of the Lord, they transformed the Roman world and beyond. Israel is God's chosen people. If God only wanted one people, Israel, he would have said to Abraham, he would not have said to Abraham, all the nations. Immediately after the Messiah rose from the dead, all of his followers were Jewish. Yeshua was a Jewish rabbi. His disciples were Jewish. Very early in the history of his church, God demonstrated that salvation was for all who will believe. You can see that in Acts 10 and 11. We, the Ecclesia, the church, will be most effective in replicating the church, the body of Messiah, when we fulfill the calling to be one new man and Messiah. Gentile believers who fully understand the one new man will make Jewish non-believers <coughs> excuse me, jealous because of their love for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their love for all of Israel. This will lead to all of Israel being saved, which leads to the final great awakening and return of our Lord. So I hope I didn't read too fast. Any questions, or do you want me to, any questions on what I just shared with you before we get into prayer? Um, I got a question, Gurney. You know, we've had some pushback on this term marriage in the one you man. I'd, I'd like to hear you, some of you. I, I think, I think marriage is the right term because it's, because he's, because in Ephesians it says he makes the two into one new man. And when, when I look in the Bible to see what God is doing when he talks about making two into one, it is in fact, it's represented in Genesis, which is when he made that, brought, he created marriage with Adam and Eve. But it's not uh, a blueprint. It's an allegory or a representation. So um, that's why I, ex I extracted from it, you know, the man doesn't stop being man and the woman doesn't stop being woman. And the point of this marriage is procreation to produce more godly offspring, which is also what it says in Mal Malachi. So in this marriage, he's not asking the Jew to stop being a Jew or the Gentile to stop being a Gentile. Now, there's a lot of instruction on marriage in the Bible. For example, it says the man is supposed to lay down his life for, um, for his bride, for his wife. Well, there's a, I even, even that applies here because I think there's a way in which um, the Gentile church needs to lay down its life for, for the Jewish, for the Messianic church. And similarly, the Messianic church needs to lay down its life for the Gentile church. Now, the reason this isn't an exact blueprint is because it's not at all in, clear in scripture which one of the two, the Gentile or the Jew, is the bride or the groom. And I think that's because that we, as, as entities, we play both roles. And it's, you know, sometimes it's bride, sometimes it's groom. And so we can't we are not supposed to point at each other and say, oh, you didn't do your part because we're both responsible for both parts. Um, we're both responsible for both of the responsibilities that are outlined in, by marriage in, in the church. Um, there's also this thing, at least, you know, the, the, other reason, the other reason I think that people sort of re, 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 um, recoil at the notion of a marriage is, is the, the influence of replacement theology on the Gentile church. Because replacement theology teaches them that, that they are complete without any, any, any part of the messianic body. And the one new man understanding marriage as a representative says you cannot be complete without them. We are not complete without one another. The messianic body isn't complete without the Gentile body, and the Gentile body isn't complete without the messianic body. So we're being encouraged to explore what God has given to each of us and to appreciate it and love it without trying to become the other person like, like you would do in a marriage. I mean, I've learned a lot through my wife, fortunately, or I probably wouldn't be here right now. Uh, and, and so that, I, you know, I just don't, I think it's, I think it's, it's the best model that I know of, Grant. Any other questions? I just make a quick comment. Sure, go ahead, Susan. Which the Lord just brought to my thoughts as you were speaking. You know, the enemy has been messing with the identities of people in marriage for a long time now. And so it's really what's happening in the world is really a parallel of what he's doing in the body of Christ. You know, that, that he doesn't want people to understand their identities within the marriage 
you know, within a picture of a marriage, you know, he, he doesn't want people to know what their roles are. He, the enemy doesn't want them to, to understand and be able to um, even reconcile with one another. You know, he'd rather the enemy is much, much more for divorce than he is for, for forgiveness and, and reconciliation and mercy and, and all of those things. And so it's really an interesting picture. You know, I, I know people don't like that idea of, of the marriage thing, but I think it's really significant that, that the enemy's doing in the world what he's also doing in the church. Yeah, that's nice. The other thing that occurred to me is that um, what happened after Peter went to Cornelius and, and the Lord poured out his Holy Spirit on them, which is a direct fulfillment of Malachi, is the apostles and the apostles in Jerusalem accepted that the Gentiles had an equal right. They, accept, they accepted that covenant that God was establishing between Messianic and Messianic and Jewish believers. And that's ex again what happened in the first Jerusalem council when they were getting over, well, do you have to follow the law? So, I mean, if you look at just what scripture says, it's really clear that the church accepted that. And I believe it's because the church accepted that, that the power of God was poured on it. And if we want that kind of power in us now, we had better accept it under God's conditions. At least that's the way I read Malachi. Yeah, Somebody, I, think, ahead, and I, I find it interesting that in this, that scripture Gurney read from Malachi, it says, you know, not one who had the spirit divorced his wife. So, you know, we're, as Grant likes to say, you know, if you want the fire, you have to connect the wire. Well, if we want the Holy Spirit poured out, we need this connection and that scripture reaffirms that, at least I think so. Any other questions? I think it's also important for us disciples of this message for us to, you know, get a clearer um, a clearer take on how to communicate, you know. So I've, you know, with some of the pushback we received on the marriage thing and because the marriage situation was so under attack, that doesn't mean we, we shouldn't go forth and communicate this beautiful union and the glory that they had but uh, perhaps the safest way for us to to communicate it is that it's a type of it's a type of marriage and that yes yeah. that's the wording i've start i i adapted in um in the study guide uh i i never left it um but i i felt like we needed to define it better you know and it uh you know, moving forward, I think having the right terminology is going to help us more effectively communicate the message. I have yeah. a question for Harriet on that one. Uh, and I know we have to get in time to prayer. But so, you know, because it says, so, you know, we're talking about the marriage piece, right? That um, we're both equal, but we have different roles. But, you know, and the word when it says, but wives, submit to your husband. So so there's a, you know, a covering place in that. So what, how would you, like, unpack that as far as, like, the one new man piece? Um, well, I don't know how far you can extend the type, but the scripture also says submit to one another. So... There is a mutual submission, um, although in marriage, there, you know, clearly there are scriptures about the husband being the head of the, the marriage, but there is also a place, you know, for both to submit to one another. Um, yeah. I'd like to throw in that, you know, in terms of Yeshua, submitting himself to the father and it is in the role of submission that we learn the most about grace and that one of the things that we do is is that we have this idea that the woman's role by submitting is somehow secondary and yet if you relate that to how the lord submitted to his father i would hardly say that yeshua's role is secondary well, if you think about it, Harriet must, was mentioning this yesterday, 
the Jew and the Gentile are to be in an allegory married to one another. And when they get, when we get the church gets it together, then it becomes the bride of Christ. So the Ecclesia gets married to Christ. And then it's all summed up in God the Father. So that, you know, so, so it's like it all, it's all, it's all going to end in him anyway, but it has to, it has to be summed up in his way. What's interesting is that the bride here is both uh, Jew and Gentile. Correct. The bride is the one you met. That yeah. makes it even more interesting. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, identity, gender identity. There you go. Don't even go there. <laughs> I mean, and it all ties back into this John 17 unity that we've been praying into as well. Well, and I, before I, I, you know, I wanted to make this point, though, that it is our willingness to submit that shows our maturity as a leader. You're, you're muted or somehow, Harry. Kathy, uh, did you, did you, oh, go ahead, Bob. Did you, uh, what I'm saying, what I'll, I'll just repeat it. That it is Yeshua's willingness to submit that shows his maturity as a leader. Hmm. Um, and, and that I think one of the challenges that we have as men, I mean, I, I even know and, and when I'm talking to Wendy and I want to make a particular point and I, and I can sense that sometimes she is sensing that by submitting to me that she is not being treated in, in an equal way. And, and part of the thing that I'm, I'm trying to do is say, okay, Bob, how can you make the point that you're making without her feeling like you're lording over her? Okay, in other words, marriage, marriage is, a, is a, an amazing dynamic because the two of them, in order for a marriage to work, the two of them both have to feel that they're equal to each other. And so my point is, is that what I think we as men lose track of is, is that it's a woman's submission to us that is symbolic of her ability to lead in a more passive way, as opposed to say that because she's submitting, that she's somehow less. That submission is a form of leadership. It is not a surrender. It's an understanding as to how the dynamics of the role work and that one of the things that a woman does that makes her role, I think, even tougher is, is that she leads from behind, if I can quote Barack Obama, okay? Terrible, forgive me, Father God, I have just committed the unpardonable sin, okay? But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but that, that is, you know, that's the irony of this thing is, is that Wendy shows me so much of her maturity sometimes when she's just quiet. Kathy, did you yeah. have something you wanted to say? Well, I'm burning, what was it? Kathy, go ahead on yeah. the Carly? Carly. Oh yeah, I have a scripture here that my friend shared with me that changed my whole uh, paradigm about submission. And it's from the, the, the uh, Passion Version. And out of your reverence for Christ, be supportive for each other in love. Yeah. For wives, this means being devoted to your husbands like you are tenderly devoted to your, our Lord. For the husband provides leadership, just as Christ provides leadership. And in, this, in the same way, the church is devoted to Christ. And to the husbands, you're to demonstrate love for your wives with the same tender devotion that Christ demonstrated to us, his bride. And so the emphasis of submission really is about tender devotion. And, you know, it's caused Christ, you know, our relationship with God is a love affair, a love relationship, the yeah. same with husband and wife. And he says the two are one, being tenderly devoted to each other. And so it takes away all of this idea of somebody lording over because Christ lords over, lorded over by dying for us. That's you know, there was no Lord on that and yep. lording over and no para, uh, no paradigm, no pyramid. It was just a love relationship. And that's what the family represents, you know, and that's what the husband and wife that's they're being one so tenderly devoted. We don't see that. That's good. Often. You That's know, good. we love grown cold. So that changed totally how I feel about submission completely. So Gunny Harry, lead us into prayer. Yes, yeah, so 
Um, we have a few things we like to pray about, but I think um, Jesus prayed in John 17 that we would be one as he and the Father are one. And so we'll start by um, praying towards um, the Gentiles to understand the Messianic body does not have to become Gentiles. And for the Messianic body to understand that the um, that the Gentile body doesn't have to become Jewish. It's not that, what it is, is there's not a requirement on either one. There's no problem, you know, there's no problem with what people do, but there's no biblical requirement for this trying to convert everybody to be the same because the Father likes diversity. Father, I just thank you, and, and we can just start with this and people can pray out as they feel appropriate and, and we'll try to follow the Holy Spirit here. Father, I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for what Bob shared. And it lines up perfectly where you told the disciples that he who wants to be the leader must be servant of all. And Father, I thank you for, for this new thing you're doing. And it's not a new thing. It's been in scripture for a long time. For you're making your, your messianic and your Gentile ecclesia into one to be the tree of life that shows who you are to the world. Right? That's, that's the point. We're trying to to represent you to the world so we can change the world. And Father, we, we unfortunately have been at war with each other for 1700 years, where the Gentile church, and I'm a member of the Gentile church, rejected the authority and, and the relationship with the, with the Jewish church and went off and thought that they could be yours without the other part of the tree, which is completely wrong. And Father, I repent of that for, my, for, my, my, for the Gentile church. I ask that you would help us as, as part of your ecclesia to see the beauty of what you're doing in this time and to fully appreciate all of you, the feast that you celebrate, all of the things that you've given to our messianic brothers, Lord, and, and understand how the light that they have can illuminate who we are in you, in Yeshua's name. And Lord, I pray as part of the messianic branch of your body, that you would forgive us as Jewish people for not receiving the Gentiles and um, for who they are and how you made them and not receiving their traditions and their holidays and thinking that we have to stick with things the way they you ordained them in the scripture in the Old Testament, Lord God, but not realizing that you have done something new. So Lord, we pray that you would bring together in love these two parts of your body that we could honor and appreciate and respect one another um, as you would have us, that your, your bride could be perfected in Yeshua's name. Hello, I just want to stand in the gap for um, our messianic family and father come to you and ask for forgiveness for um, not uh, wanting to connect with the church for not wanting to love the church for not wanting to love uh, our gentile family I ask you for forgiveness for that father that you would uh, um, Lord just release your mercy and wash us clean in this place and then enable us to reconcile and confess any pride, any defensiveness, any anger, any critical judgmental spirit, Father, uh, towards the church. Lord, please forgive us, Father. Please forgive us and help us to start anew, Father. Hashem Yeshua HaMashiach. Father, also on behalf of the Messianic body, I ask, Lord, I, I repent for, um, for us isolating ourselves from the Gentile side of the family and, and rejecting them and, and staying away when what we should have been doing is, is, is joining them, reaching out to them, and also praying for them, Lord. Forgive us for not praying for our brothers and sisters uh, on the other side of the family, Lord, when, when we should have been praying for that reconnection and praying for that unity. And instead, we were just not necessarily going against it, but just ignoring it. 
And Lord, forgive us for that ignorance, Lord. Forgive us for the times that, that we just looked askance and said, oh, they're on their own. They're separate from us and we're not gonna worry about them. Lord, we should be worrying about them. And I ask that you would cause the messianic body to rise up in prayer for their Gentile brothers and sisters in a new way, that you would stir their hearts, Lord, to look at that side of the family with new eyes, Lord, and a new heart. And I thank you for that in Yeshua's name. Father, we thank you that um, we have seen um, that you have uh, related this to like a marriage. And we know, Lord, in relationships, when there's blurred boundaries, then there's misunderstandings and there is heartache and there is um, confusion. So, Lord, I just want to repent on behalf of the Gentile family for overstepping the boundaries many times into the messianic camp and even telling Jewish people how to run their country, Lord, and just really, Lord, we just repent, Lord, of pushing and shoving and, and Lord, just overstepping the boundaries and making, the, making a confusion out of the relationship. And so, Lord, I just pray today that you would clear up the boundaries, the, the, the clear boundaries between Jews and Gentiles so that we can have a healthy relationship, that we can be, feel safe with one another and that the confusion will be removed as to who does, whose role is what and how to respect one another's boundaries in Yeshua's name. Yes. Amen. Abba, Papa, Father, God, I humbly ask you, Lord God, to forgive us, Lord God, 1,700 years, Lord God. Your word says in Philippians 2, 3, be free from pride-filled opinions, for they will only harm your cherished unity. Don't allow self-promotion to hide in your hearts, but in authentic humility, put others first and view others as more important than yourself. Lord God, I humbly ask you to forgive us where we, the, the Gentile church, Lord God, has put self-promotion, Lord God that promoted themselves when you have clearly said the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Metakumba, Abba, Papa, Father, God, that we would humble us if we refuse to humble ourselves, Papa, that you would humble us, Lord God, that we would love as you have called us to love, Lord God, to wash one another's feet, to pray for each other, Lord God, and that no one is more important than the other. As I've often prayed, the eyelash cannot say to the toenail, I don't need you. We need one another. It is a marriage. It is a wedding. You're coming back for a bride without spot, stain, wrinkle, or blemish. And she is sanctified and a pure virgin promised to one husband, Yeshua. Abba, Papa, Father God. Yes, that you would continue to remove the stones from our heart, as you have said in your word. Clean us out, the cleansing and the purging and the pruning. In the name of Yeshua, in the authority of his name, Lord God. And we stop misusing his name, <laughs> Lord God. That childlike faith and a humble heart. Amen. Lord, Lord spoke to me a few weeks ago about how in the marriage ceremony, when the veil is lifted, that's the last thing that happens before the bride is kissed. And uh, that I'm just praying, Father God, that in, in the season as you're lifting the veil over Israel, Lord, 
that we would all recognize that this is the part of the marriage ceremony where the veil gets lifted when the husband kisses the wife and that there's something of the the sealing of the service and the vows and the ceremony when the veil is lifted lord and that's the moment when everyone who is there at the marriage service when everybody sees the husband honor his wife lifts the veil she is now revealed to him and to the rest of the audience because it's time for the bride to be kissed and father god I, i'm believing that like every man the reason that he gets married is is that at the end of the ceremony he longs to kiss his bride but that's the culmination that's what we look for so father god prepare us lord prepare us so that the veil can be lifted over israel and over our lives and over our hearts father so that we would be the bride that you've called us to be father in Jesus. Jesus name. Let's have a couple of other people pray that haven't prayed yet. Father God, I just forgive us, Lord. I just, you know, every time I read Psalm 133, it's so clear. It's after we're together, after we're together, after we're together, there the Lord bestows his blessing even life forevermore so lord would you it's so simple right it's like a b c it's so simple but lord we don't know how to do this we don't we don't know how to do this or we don't it's not on it's not top on our list lord so would you would you stir us lord to be able to move in that way naturally just as simple it is as it is, can't we all get along and love each other? We miss it, Lord, in our own humanity. So I'm asking in the name of Yeshua, I speak for myself. I speak for, for you know, however, <laughs> whoever on their heart needs to hear this. Lord, I'm asking that you would move our hearts, soften our hearts, give us that liquid love. Show us to love our brothers and sisters. In Yeshua's yeah. name. Lord, forgive us of our lack of understanding, the Gentile church, um, that there has been, uh, just as Gurney was sharing uh, and doing this teaching, which was, it's, it's absolutely awesome. But Lord, for 1700 years, men, much of the Gentile church has been in living in ignorance and misunderstanding the scripture and, and believing that no longer do the Jews are, are, the, are any of the promises that are made in the word that comes for the Jewish people, that they're no longer there for them, but it's now for that for the Gentile church exclusively. And Lord, forgive us of that. And I ask, oh God, that there would be a greater degree of understanding in within the Gentile church. Use Grant's book, his Bible study. Use Gurney's teaching and other books. Uh, my friend Ariel, his book, oh Lord, and, and Bob Wolf's book. Lord, that you would uh, open doors and open the eyes of the Gentile church of their understanding, oh God, that there would be a greater degree that there must be. You're calling for your bride to come back. You're calling for your bride to come together, Lord, for the Jew and the Gentile to come together, Lord. And I ask, oh God, give us a greater, all of us, a, a greater degree of understanding what it looks like so that we may embrace it, oh God. We've been so dysfunctional for so many years, Lord, and I pray for that great, a greater degree of healing in that area, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
Yes, Lord, we agree with these prayers. And I just ask, Father, that you would create situations where reconciliation can take place, where people can talk and confront one another. And, Lord, really uh, talk about the issues of the heart, Lord, to create situations more and more between Jewish people and Gentile people, Lord, that you would create platforms and conferences and healing and deliverance conferences, Lord, where people can really just come together and, and deal with the real issues of the heart towards, one, towards, them, towards you and towards one another in Yeshua's name. Father, we're coming into a new place and a new time. And we ask you to help us to prepare for it because we yes. need to become masters of being able to communicate your heart in this place. And Father, it's one thing to think about it. It's another thing to understand it. And it's even another to be able to articulate it in a way that can break down barriers and divisions and plant seeds of restoration. Hallelujah. We know that many obstacles that are there that the enemy has that even cause blindness and uh, a blocking to this message that is now so foreign. Um, Lord, help us to understand what's ahead of us now uh, to begin to map out a pathway and a plan for you to bring about this restoration and the alignment in your family. Hashem Yeshua. Amen. Can I just say, um, we often pray about, and I was just praying with um, a Jewish um, couple and um, his wife made that reference about Gentile church. And then, you know, he said, there's no Gentile church. It's only one church. And I, I do agree. I guess we have to change or the way we speak. It's only one church. If we continue to say a Gentile church, this is where all this um, wall, but it's one. It's one, it's only one, one, no Gentile church. And so Father, I just pray for that revelation that you will bring into the body, Father, that there is no Gentile church. There is no Gentile church. Father, that replacement theology that, um, has been going around and the enemy used that to bring an avoc father into the body. Lord, we ask that you will bring this revelation to us, Holy Spirit, that it's only one church, that there is no Gentile church. I pray this in Yeshua's name with thanksgiving, amen. I just make a quick comment about that as a, as a Jewish believer who attends a, a Gentile majority church and has been to many conferences and things within the church body. There are often times when certain language is used within the church that that I don't understand, that, that doesn't make sense to me, or that I literally, I was at a conference recently and, and um, the, the speaker was talking, using the word regeneration to talk about salvation. And I literally had to take my phone out and look up what that meant because 
you know, having been in the Gentile church for a short time, that language meant nothing to me. And when I looked it up, what it actually meant was being born again. And so there can be situations when you're a Jew in a Gentile situation where you feel separate, you feel different, you feel disconnected because of the language being used, because of some of the religious references being used. Like, uh, you know, when I first came into the church, I mean, it's a long time now, but, you know, when people would start talking about Lent and people would start talking about things like that, I, that had no bearing for me as a Jew. And so there is a Gentile church. And to, to, to say that there isn't is really a denial of, of the truth. And I'm not saying that, the, that it's wrong because obviously, you know, we all have our backgrounds and we all have our differences, but I think, and, and you know, Grant really stresses this in his book and in his teachings, we need to bring in a level of dual language you know i i call the lord yeshua you call him jesus you call him the christ i call him the messiah you know and and i think there needs to be a level of shift in the language to make everyone comfortable because if you're going to merge the body together the way it's meant to be merged together and we're supposed to be unified i just really feel that that we need, there's something that needs to happen there. It's not just going to be an automatic thing that everything's going to merge. And, you know, I hope no one takes offense to anything I've said, because I'm just giving you my point of view, you know, other people have other points of view, but, but there is an issue there that needs to be addressed. And that's really all I wanted to say. Johnny, can I come in? We're, we're running out of time. Yes, yeah, sorry. So mm -hmm. let me, I'm just going to pray with, with what Yeshua or Jesus prayed in John 17. I pray not only for these, and he was talking about his disciples, but also for those who believe in me through their word, which is all of us on this call, whether we're Jewish or Gentile. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be made completely one, that the world may know you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Thank you, Father. And we pray this. We, what Yeshua gets, what Jesus gets, what Jesus prays for, he, he gets, Lord. And, and we are praying that this word would become truer and truer each day as we bring this message to, to your called out ones. And Father, we pray for the next um, the next group that's going to be taking over after us. I'm not sure who we should pass host to, because um, I don't see the people we need. What? Ryan. Oh, Ryan, Ryan. Ryan. Okay, Brian. All right, Brian. We'll do that in just a second. We pray for for Brian and Shannon, Lord, that you would bless them and 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 teach them and guide them as they lead as they lead the worship. And, and lead, lead those who can remain on the call into worship and those who join. We ask that you, you will continue your work in the next hour of prayer in Yeshua's name. Tony, before we hand over, can I just make just one comment? I thought, Go ahead. Uh, I thought Helena brought up a really interesting point. I'm, uh, I'm leading One You Man next Thursday, and we will dedicate... Uh, next Thursday to praying into a deeper understanding of terminology. So I just want to encourage you, reach out to your friends and those of us we're connected with, because you know what? We need to be able to break these things down and find a way to communicate them in a deeper place of understanding. I know exactly where Helena is coming from and I know exactly where Susan's coming from. And there can be a, a, a real meeting place here, and that's what Abba wants for us in this place. So I just want to encourage you next Thursday, we will, uh, we, we will go into this subject and pray into it in a greater way. Amen. We bless. Bless you, Brian and Shannon. And you Thank too, you, Susan. Grant, Thanks, you Susan. Welcome.